Holy Spirit, grace given spiritual gifts. And that's what we're studying. And we went through a few things already, kind of intro. One of them being, how can I discover my spiritual gift? And I want to run through those real quick. Number one, make sure you're a Christian. That usually is the best thing to do right off the bat is to have a relationship with Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, break power, sin's power in your life. And that is by being in God's word, by being in prayer and just letting him take the dross out of your life and to point out to you through his word and also just with the prompting of the Holy Spirit issues that need to be taken care of. I didn't know I sinned as much as I did, you know, until I started reading God's word and found out, boy, I do a lot of things that I shouldn't, and not all the things I should. And unfortunately, you know, that's uh, what the, you know, old sin nature does in each and every one of us. But the point is, is that God can break that power in our lives if we'll let him do so. Because as, as we heard this morning from pastor, he wants us to look like the stamped, impressed image of his son, Jesus Christ. And then third is concentration on others. If we're using our spiritual gifts uh, to take care of others' needs, are being involved in edifying the church, then we are doing what we're supposed to be. And then discern your motives. You know, we always talk about the motives of the heart. And that is, is that why are you doing what you're doing? You know, is this prompting of the Holy Spirit? Or are you doing it for a pat on the back like the good old Pharisees? I always think of the one when the, of the tax collector and the, and the Pharisee and there and the Pharisee saying, I'm glad I'm not like this tax collector. And the tax collector says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And it's like, guess who went home, you know, with a restored relationship was, of course, the tax collector. So you got to be careful of your motive and then examine your irritations. You know, uh, if you drive in Houston traffic, I guarantee you, you get irritated. <laughs> and it's not an easy thing to, to do to get over it sometimes. But then also look at your characteristics. There's things about you in your life, and we'll run over a few characteristics as we go through these spiritual gifts so that you'll have an indication of what kind of constitutes what would be an indication of that gift. And then also give adequate time to find your gift, and that's through studying God's word, speaking with others. They may be able to tell you what they've noticed in your life. Humble your heart. You know, if we're not in an attitude of service, we're not going to properly, you know, be willing to wait upon others like we should. And then also identify gift misuses. Uh, like I said uh, previously, sometimes we identify our gift by how we misuse it rather than how we use it. And it's unfortunate, but it does help us, you know, then know what our gift is and, and then to learn the right way to utilize it. And then... If you follow those, these six principles of consecration, concentration, the principle of illumination, principle of possibilities, principle of communication, and that's letting others tell you about what they see in you, and then the principle of continuation, and that is always being in God's word and in an attitude of prayer at all times. Okay. There we go. All right. Romans 12, 6. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Everybody has a gift or gifts. The Holy Spirit, when he comes into your life, once you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you will receive gifts from the Holy Spirit. Out of 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7, I took the following excerpts to kind of go over what uh, the varieties are of how things operate within a given church uh, congregation. The first being a variety of gifts of the, that is from the Greek charismaton, and it means a gift of grace. So bottom line is you can't do anything to earn the gift that God has given you. Okay. He, you know, the Holy spirit has decided what gift or gifts that you need in your life to be a benefit to the others within the congregation that you're a part of, because that's where you're supposed to be doing, serving God, serving others, not being self-serving, because bottom line, it's a gift of grace, just like our salvation is a gift of grace from God. 
so is the gifts that he gives us to operate in a spiritual gift. It says there's a variety of services, and that's from the diaconion, which means waiting at a table. That's also where we get the word deacon from, and basically table waiting. In other words, being willing to serve others, you know, and taking the time to serve others, being willing to give of yourself to others. And then the variety of effects, and that is from energy matan, means an operation or working using God's energy or his power and people of faith. That is, you know, whatever we do in our lives, we don't have power of ourselves. It is God's power working within us that gives us ability to exercise our spiritual gifts. And just as uh, it says in the Corinthians, it says, but to each one is given a manifestation of the spirit for the common good, common good. And, you know, I always think of, you know, when it goes back to uh, Acts, when it talks about how that the Christians held everything in common, you know. And everybody goes, well, that sounds like communism. Well, no, that was not the case. The case was, as they saw to it, that they put everything together in a pot, so to speak, to share with those that had need because they drew only what they would need. And God met their needs abundantly, I guarantee you, simply because they were willing to do what he had called them to do, and that is to work for the common good. And that's what each and every one of us, our gift is, is that it's important for us to exercise that gift here within this congregation, once we find out what it is. And like I said, there's others around here that will probably look at you and tell you, I've seen what you do, and I know, I think, what your gift is. And that sometimes really helps us to identify it. I want to go through the characteristics of the gift of service. Characteristic of the service gift is that this person will see and meet practical needs they're very readily to identify a need in somebody's life, not necessarily something that someone has brought out to them, but that is where that they have seen it and realized there is a need there and they are quite willing in order to take care of it any way that they can. They also work to free others to achieve. When you have those that are out meeting the practical needs of people, those are the other different gifts that work within different realms of the church are able to do what they need to do. In other words, when you've got somebody seeing to the needs of the people, then you have others that have their teaching gifts, others that have their preaching gifts, you know, all the different gifts of mercy and all that together. Others are free then to exercise their gifts and to achieve what they're supposed to do in the building up of the church. Also, Bo, this person also disregards weariness. You know, they may be weary, but they're never going to let you know that. They will serve and serve and serve and serve, and you'll never know how tired they are because they're not going to tell you. They're alert to likes and dislikes. Uh, they are able to really discern in a person's needs what they like and what they don't like, you know? Uh, this is all Holy Spirit driven, you know, so because it's Holy Spirit driven, a person that is using this gift of service is going to be able to discern what a person likes or doesn't like. In other words, you wind up with a casserole you'll probably eat instead of one you wouldn't. Meets needs quickly. This person's not going to wait for somebody else to step in and do something. They see a need and they are going to immediately react to it. They're going to immediately see to it that they step out in faith and do what they need to do. And they also desire to be with others because being in the gift of service, they like being in the company of, of the church family. And that way, when they're in, the, when they're in that type of uh, relationship, being around others, it helps them then to see and meet the needs. It helps them uh, to see what others need to be doing within the church and it's helping them also to learn the likes and dislikes of others but they desire to be with others because if they're around others then they're going to know what service is needed so naturally they see to it that they you know take the time to be there for each and every person that needs to be they also have difficulty in saying no that's why that they disregard weariness they will say yes before without even thinking if somebody says there's a need okay what do what i need to do you know tell me when 
I'll take care of it right now. And yet they will overload themselves. And we'll see that in a little bit. They have a special enjoyment though in meeting the needs of others. They get a great satisfaction with the gift of service of being able to meet those needs because God always provides what they need in order to meet those needs, you know? And it may be, you know, something in a physical realm. It may be something in a financial realm. It may be something just in an emotional or spiritual realm that a person needs uh, for this person to come alongside of them and to exercise this gift of service in meeting this person's needs. But they get a special enjoyment out of it. And I think that's uh, when it goes back to what uh, we looked at uh, previously, uh, the word for uh, uh, charismatic or charisma comes from kara, which means joy is the basis. And when we serve God, when we use our spiritual gifts, then we are going to be exercising the joy that we need to exercise in our, to have in our lives, you know? And uh, my <laughs> one of the favorite things I like to point out uh, when I speak at churches uh, for the Gideons, uh, not necessarily always to the congregation, but sometimes it looks like everybody's set out there and ate sour persimmons, you know? And I'm like, where's the joy in being here worshiping God? You know, so I think that's what it's, really great that uh, those that are in service do have this enjoyment from meeting the needs of others. It gives them that sense of satisfaction. They don't worry about recognition. What they are worried about is, did I meet this person's needs and did I meet them well? And so once they've done that, then they will be very satisfied with what they've done so far in their life. Then the next thing I want to go through is the misuses. When somebody gets involved in meeting the needs of others, they can very quickly disregard their personal and family needs. And when that happens, everybody suffers, not only the person with the service gift, but the family of that person. And uh, it can cause a lot of dissension within the families. And that's why that you have to be really aware if you have the gift of service, that you take care of your family needs and your own needs. You know, uh, when, when it talks about personal needs, there's things that you need to see to that you take care of yourself. For uh, one example is you don't push yourself beyond the limits that you should go. Uh, that's where it, uh, you know, down below, you'll see wearing themselves out physically and we'll go through that. But also, you know, if they are meeting the needs of others, they may, or may appear pushy, you know? And uh, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but a person in the gift of service has such a great desire to meet the needs of someone that they may seem pushy. You know, it's like, well, no, tell me what I can do. Tell me what I can do. Tell me what I can do. And they're like, look, I'm fine. Well, tell me what I can do. It's like, would you just go away? You know, and yet the person really is just trying to be there for somebody and to, and to really help them out in whatever that they can do. And of course, going back to meeting the needs, you know, uh, somebody, you know, uh, talking about the things that you can do to meet needs in the acts of service, it's not just like bringing a casserole to them. It's like maybe you cut their grass, maybe you help do their laundry, maybe you go and do their dishes, or, you know, there's just so many different facets of the gift of service. Uh, that's why uh, that ties in with the waiting at tables is because it's a, it is a, it is a uh, opportunity for a person to really reach out and possibly win someone to the Lord simply because of their wanting to meet their needs. Because even though this operates within the church realm, it also operates outside of the church realm when a person needs to meet, uh, sees needs that need to be met. If y'all remember when we had Harvey come through here, our church did a tremendous job of bringing people in to go and muck out houses and to provide cleaning supplies and to do everything we could to help those that were devastated. And there are those that really exercise their gift of service big time and did it joyfully and probably wore themselves out doing it as well because there's a lot to be done. But, you know, they didn't question about, you know, how, uh, how, how long I need to do this or how much I need to do. 
They just knew there was a need and they continued to work on meeting that need for however long it took. And so sometimes though, that, like I said, that can appear pushy. Accepting too many jobs at one time. Uh, I could tell you for personal experience that if you take on too many things at one time, you're not gonna do anything well at all. And you will have those jobs that you've taken on suffer. And the people that you're trying to help are going to suffer because you're not going to meet their needs properly because you're doing too many things at one time. Another misuse of it is going around the proper authorities to, in order to get jobs done. <laughs> uh, what's that old adage? I'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission. Sometimes that happens that way, you know, uh, but it's not, it's not like that they're deliberately trying to uh, reject authority. It is that they're just wanting to get the job done so much that they're willing to just go around and not wait for the authority to do something. And that can wind up with them getting in there and pushing somebody away rather than really actually helping meet somebody's needs. Wearing themselves out physically. That goes back to accepting the too many jobs and uh, disregarding for the family and personal needs. They will push themselves beyond their limits until finally they are not able to really meet the needs of others like they should, simply because they have worn themselves out. Want to do the jobs themselves and excluding other, excludes others is another misuse of it. I know that uh, when you, uh, <laughs> sometimes in a job, if you know what it is that you need done and you have others that are under your authority and they're not seeming to get it done, you're like, okay, get out of my way. I'll take care of it. Well, those were the uh, misusing the service gift. They're going to do it themselves and exclude others. They're not even going to give somebody else an opportunity to, talk, to take part in it. They're going to jump in it and do it right away themselves. That's where it comes like where it said previously, quickly meeting the needs. They are going to want to jump in there, get it done. And then it goes back. They don't care about the authority and uh, they don't care about bringing any others into it. But now also another misuse of the service gift is being hurt by those that are ungrateful for their help. You know, sometimes misusing it, we're looking for a pat on the back in the service gift for what we've done for somebody. And the whole idea behind the service gift is just simply doing what God called you to do for others. It was not about doing anything else, but strictly just doing it without any, any wanting a pat on the back or someone to say great job or somebody to give you recognition for what you did for others. And a person that's misusing the service gift will wind up getting their uh, feelings hurt if somebody doesn't act grateful to them or someone is ungrateful, you know? And I guess when you say ungrateful, that would include somebody says, well, you know, I appreciate you coming over here and helping me, but that's not the way I do it. <laughs> so, you know, I'm sure each and every one of us have our preferences of how we want things done, but that doesn't mean that it is going to get done properly. And uh, ultimately, people that are misusing the gift that are getting hurt by others, they may quit trying to serve others. And that's one of the, that's one of the hardest things for God to see as one of his children with this gift of service that can meet so many needs and he provides so much for them to use to meet these needs that they get hurt to where that they withdraw within themselves and quit doing that gift of service simply because people are just not grateful. And yet God didn't call us to be grateful. You know, I mean, to, to worry about whether people are grateful for what we do or not. He's called us simply to exercise those spiritual gifts the way that we need to. One uh, example of a person that has the gift of service was Timothy. And of course, as we know with Timothy, Timothy had a lot of issues he had to deal with. And, uh, you know, 
Paul had come alongside of him and mentored him as a father image in order to help Timothy be able to exercise his gifts properly. One of the gifts he did have was a gift of service. And in Philippians, one of the indications of it from Philippians 2, verses 19 through 20, It tells us, but I hope in the Lord Jesus Christ to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition, for I have no one else of kindred spirit who would genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they seek all, they all seek after their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. And so Timothy, Paul knew that he could send him because he would recognize the needs of all the people there in that particular situation in Philippians. And he wanted to make sure that who he sent would be someone that would recognize and meet the needs that were there. He sent Timothy to quite a few places. He did several others that he sent out. But Timothy who was one of his, one of his dearest to his heart because I think for one thing, you know, Timothy... Obviously, he did not have a father figure in his life because we know that his, his mother and his grandmother were the ones that instructed him in God's word and that he was able then to embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And then he also had his gifts that God uh, you know, provided with him so that he was able to uh, do for others without thinking about himself. But sometimes we can, uh, we can see, too, where Timothy was having anxiety issues, and I think that might have been due to he probably pushed himself to the point of weariness instead of uh, really taking the time to take care of himself like he should. That's what happens with someone that has that gift of service is that uh, they will not take care of their personal needs. They're too worried about meeting someone else's needs, and they will go without in order to meet someone's needs other than their own or even their family. So I think that's one thing that Timothy had to deal with is seeing to it that he did right by himself is so he would be able to do right by others. And then in uh, Philippians 2, 22, it tells us, but you know of his proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Timothy definitely had the gift of service. He served Paul quite well. And Paul also, as he was on his last legs, so to speak, as he was in prison, wanted to see Timothy as well as many of the others. But I think most especially Timothy, because he was so close to him and he knew Timothy had that heart of service and he would meet the needs as best he could. And would be there for Paul no matter what. And uh, I just, uh, I really admire those that have this gift of service. Because they will do everything they can to meet people's needs. Well, no matter what it may be. And I know there's several of you here that, you know, in this congregation, there's several in this congregation that have that gift of service. They may not know it but it's quite obvious in the way that they do things. And if we are able to help each other learn what our gifts are, then we're able to really build the church up and edify. That's one thing that I, you know, it's one of the things I love about the church is that we are a praying church, that we are one that is concerned with the needs of each and every one. So even though we have those that have been given that, I guess you could say that a primary gift of service, we all have that need to serve others so that we're able to take care of the needs of the congregation as a whole. And if we don't, if we don't look at it that way, then we're going to wait for somebody else to take care of people's needs rather than if we see a need, take care of it ourselves. Because God will give you the blessings if you serve others in the way that uh, he has called us to do so. And that's why I say we have primary gifts, we have secondary gifts, the tertiary gifts probably. Uh, there's no telling how many gifts that God's Holy Spirit imparts to each and every one of us. 
but what we do is spend time in his word to learn about these gifts, learn how they operate so that we can identify what our primary one is, but at the same time also to see those that all Christian children should be exercising in their lives. And that's where you look at the gifts of service, the gifts of mercy, and the gifts of encouragement. You know, there's all types of gifts that are given that each and every one of us should exercise to a point to where that, uh, you know, like uh, I know that my wife spoke to one of our, one of our members and she talked about how encouraging just talking to her, what she called to encourage her and yet she wound up encouraged herself, you know? And so I got a feeling that the lady definitely has the gift of encouragement just as Barnabas did to where that uh, she, she uplifts other people's spirits, you know, just by conversation. And sometimes that's all it takes is somebody to, to just listen to you or somebody just reach out and say, you know, I, I, I know things are really tough for you right now. And yet I just want you to know uh, I'm here for you. So that's why we should all, you know, be willing to exercise that primary gift, but at the same time, not neglect all the additional gifts that we're called to utilize. There's so many things the Holy Spirit does within our life that helps us to be equipped in order to move forward in the things that we do. I love that fact that it talks about God's energy, God's power. In fact, that's where we get our word energy from is uh, about the uh, gifts uh, in, um, you know, in the uh, varieties, that it's a variety of effects. And, you know, effect is something that actually is tangible, something that is real. It's an operational working. It's his power working in people of faith. That means that he is giving us the ability through the Holy Spirit's power operating within us to have an effect on someone's life, a positive effect. And, you know, I, I look at those that uh, we have within our church, and I see so many of y'all that just the way that you let God work in your life, it empowers others because they feed off of the off of the energy that you are exhibiting in your life that God is working through you. And sometimes, you know, we need to see that. Uh, we need to feel that to where that we will tap into God's power. You know, I'm a, I'm an electrician. Okay. And, you know, uh, one of the, one of the things I've had happen in the past is, I've had someone come up and say, you know, my computer's not working, you know, or in fact, actually last Friday, Sandra came and told me before I left from work, she said, look, can you go over here? Because uh, these uh, radios are on the charger and the charger's not working. Well, actually it was just a simple thing of resetting the switch on the side of the uh, strip that they were all plugged into. But my point is, is that, if you're not plugged into power, nothing works. So if you're plugged into the power of God, you're definitely going to have a good effect. You're going to have it, the energy to have the effect of working upon a person's life to where that you will make a difference. You will make a difference. And that's what God calls us to do is to be difference makers to where that those that we are around will see something so different in us. They want to know what is it you got? And it's like, it's a, it's a grace gift of God. I have salvation, you know, and let me introduce you to my friend Jesus. And it gives us an opportunity through exercising our gifts to be able to reach those that are lost. You know, uh, at work, I listen to guys grumbling about all the things that are wrong with this country and all the things that's wrong with this government. And I got to thinking, you know, sometimes God lets us have what we deserve rather than what we need. And listening to uh, a deal that Sandra was reading today, it was a cartoon with Charlie Brown and sitting there with Snoopy on a dock, okay? And he's saying, you know, God's people are praying, but nothing's happening. And I think it's because they've not turned from their wicked ways and repented so I can heal their land. And sometimes, you know, I, I think about that. Sometimes we let the world interfere 
with the operation of God in our lives. And if we let the world interfere or the fear in the world interfere with our looking to God for everything, it's going to keep us from exercising these spiritual gifts for the edification of the body of Christ, the local body of Christ. And so I don't want that happening in my life. So I want God to get all the dross out of my life, but at the same time, get me not focused on how messed up this country is and how that I need to be looking to show the love of Christ to one person at a time and hopefully lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then possibly even have an opportunity to come in alongside and mentor them in God's word you know, or at least point them somewhere where that they can learn the truth. There's only one truth. I, I love the fact that we live in a society that says truth is what you make it. That's it. Bottom line, God's word, the only truth, the ultimate truth. And it's what everything else should be weighed by. And that's why that those that have these gifts need to really be exercising them but to learn about them and to learn how to live a good life, we've got to be in his word. You know, I'm not going to try to chastise anybody or make anybody feel bad, but do you read your Bible every day? And when you read it, do you study it? Do you ask the Holy spirit to open up your mind and heart to receive and then to apply what it is he has to say? Because if we do that, not only will we recognize our spiritual gifts, we'll also know how to use them properly. I'm going to close it out a little early tonight because I wanted to cover this on uh, service. But I do, uh, I want y'all to know that I am saving prophecy and I'm saving speaking in tongues for the last gifts to go over simply because of so much misinformation, so much consternation that are associated with them. But I want to spend uh, extra time on those two because that's what Paul did in Corinthians. Chapters 12, 13, and 14 deal with the uh, first Corinthians deal with the issues that the Corinthians only wanted prophecy and they only wanted speaking in tongues. They didn't care about interpretation or any other gift. They wanted the showy ones so they could walk around saying, look how spiritual I am. And yet uh, very, very few of them, I'm sure, had any of those gifts and maybe not even any of them. And that's why that right in there, you have chapter 13, where Paul speaks of love and what love is and what love isn't in order to tell them without love, there's nothing. And the only way that you can love is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and him sitting on the throne of your heart in order to give you that empowerment, that energy that you need to serve God and to serve others as you should. So there's any questions before we close out this evening? Any questions from uh, Zoom? Very good. Very, very good, Brother Steve. Well, thank you. I have a good writer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> His word definitely uh, speaks to our heart for sure. Yes, definitely. Yes, sir. Yes. Well, all y'all be blessed. Have a blessed week. And uh, we'll see you next Sunday. Lord willing, the creek don't much. rise and we don't get raptured before then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. You're welcome. Yeah. Take care, Thanks, Stephen. Bye-bye, Fred. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Stephen. You're welcome. Good night.